Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got lore, more lore, and even more lore. We're going to take a look at all of the races and their backstories leading up to Guild Wars 2. If you want to know what's going on in the world of Tyria, this is the show to watch. Stay tuned. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. You can check us out at www.talesoftyria.com. We've got a great show for you today with a bunch of special guests. Uh, I'm glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Please tell a friend or two about it, won't you? We are almost live from the great free city of Lion's Arch, and I am Bridger. I am the host for the show today. Normally, you can watch us streaming 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on uh, TalesOfTyria.com, and that's when we record the show. However, we've got a very special recording today happening earlier uh, because of uh, a couple of guests joining us. So, let me be the first to introduce Angerina. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Hello, hello. Coming to us all the way from Germany, and I must say your English is excellent. You're lying. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> I guess not. All right. That sound is Malkior joining us again. Second sh second time on the show. Welcome, sir. How you doing, Bridger? You know you've got a hand coming out of your chest. It's reaching for me now, right? That's that's kind of creepy. Yeah. If you can see the back, this is a Logitech shirt I picked up at PAX East. Oh, so it's like you're it, the it, mouse it and there's has. a hand on you? Even though, I don't even understand. Even though you can't see it. It's got W A S and D across the fingers. Oh, I see what they did there. Okay. Also joining us, we have a another lore expert, Edwin. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey there. Hello. So we are all joined today. We gave the the regular crew the night off, the night, the evening off, uh, because we're here to talk about the lore of Guild Wars. What's the story of going on here? There's a lot of interesting things happening in the world, not only because of the first game, but also in between the first game and the second game, and a lot of it revolves around dragons, which automatically makes it cool, by the way. Um, so we are... Uh, we are going to be reading the chat room here, so if you guys have any questions, if we're, if we're skipping over something too fast or there's something that you think we're missing, uh, please, you know, say, hey, you know, I don't understand this. Can you go back and talk about that? We'll be happy to do that for you. So here's what uh, we're going to do first. I just want to point out uh, there was a fantastic fantastic interview with Ree Sosby, who is one of the two people that really is the lore keeper at ArenaNet. Uh, and so she did a great, great interview with Guild Wars Insider podcast. And I've got a link to that in the show notes. So if you want to know any, and you know, if you want to get straight from the horse's mouth, basically, that's where you want to go, because that was a fantastic interview. You got a lot of really great insight into what she's doing behind the scenes, you know, coming up with the lore and how they, how they go about basically creating the canon that is Guild Wars 2. So highly recommend that. Definitely go either read it or, or listen to it. They've got the transcript on the Guild Wars Insider site. All right. That having been said, there are the five major races that you can play in Guild Wars 2. You've got the humans, you've got the Char, you've got the Asura, you've got the Silvari, and you've got the Norn. So what we're going to try to do is go through each of the histories of those races, recent histories, and give you an idea of what the Guild Wars universe is like at the beginning of Guild Wars 2. So we're going to start with the, you know, with the humans and go, okay, this is where the humans and Tyria started, then a bunch of stuff happened, and now we're at this point with the humans. And then we're going to go back and go with the Char and say, okay, here's how the Char started, and we'll go back chronologically through the Char's history. Obviously, those interleave a lot, so we'll be talking about those a uh, considerable bit back and forth, and that's you know, the, how we're going to try and run the show today. 
But we're going to start with a very basic backstory of what this whole world started as. And um, it's important for you to understand when we're talking about this, the geography of the world. So I've got a map here for us to take a look at, and I'll put a link to that in the chat room right now. Uh, if I can hit my control V quickly enough. So you can see here uh, on this map, we've got uh, the area that is basically known as Ascalon. That is the main area uh, that you start in, in Guild Wars 1, and it's the area that is going to probably be explorable in Guild Wars 2. And it's also a place where a lot of the backstory happens. So here's Ascalon. Here's the northern area where the Char homelands are. This is the far Shiver Peaks where the Norn original homelands were. Over here we have the northern Shiver Peaks. This is where the dwarves occupied at, during the Guild Wars 1. And they uh, no longer occupy that. Now this is a Norn area in Guild Wars 2. And we'll talk about how that came to be later. Over here we have the human kingdom of Krita one of the three human kingdoms, and uh, that is a, pr a primary area in Guild Wars 2 that we know about. Lion's Arch is right here in the middle. Divinity's Reach is going to be up here uh, on the top left there of Krita. And then we have the Tarnished Coast. Ratasum is the Asura home area here, uh, capital rather, and so we assume that this whole area down here is going to be playable in Guild Wars 2 as well. And so that is sort of the main areas that I expect. We might have something in the Southern Shiver Peaks too. I'm not sure. Do you guys know of any other areas that I didn't cover that we know that's going to be visible or visitable? Um, at release, the, I think we're covered. I think that's it at release that we know of so far. Um, so that is sort of the geography. And if you're not if you're not able to picture the map, I recommend you check it out um, so that you have at least an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about the uh, the world here. Now, the other thing that you should know is the way that they count years here because there's a couple of different ways that we're going to be bouncing back and forth through time. But the main calendar is called the Muvelian calendar. Muvelian. And that dates the year zero at the, at the time at which the human gods leave the earth, or the Tyrian earth, as it were, it leave Tyria. Uh, because for a while, before that point, the gods were actually on the earth mixing with the humans, and at the year zero is when they, you know, ascended and left and didn't come back. Now, they still influence, uh, you know, the world, but they are just not physically there for you to go visit them, as it were. So that's where this year zero is. Guild Wars 1, to keep it in perspective, takes place around the year 1070 to about 1078 uh, AE after Exodus. So about a thousand years after the gods leave is when Guild Wars 1 takes place. Guild Wars 2 takes place about 250 some odd years after that, about 1320 something right there. So you can see how the time kind of plays into things. So let's then start uh, at the beginning, I guess, because at the beginning of the world, the earliest thing that anybody knows about in Tyria are these great giants known as Giganticus Lupicus, and they lived about 10,000 years before the human god Exodus. And also at that time, around that time, was the period at which the Elder Dragons lived. These are known as Zaitan, Primordius, Jormag, Kralkatoric, and Bubbles, the unnamed deep sea dragon that we don't know anything about, but they nickname Bubbles for some reason. So those elder dragons are the ones that are causing all the problems in Guild Wars 2 for the most part. And those dragons lived way before the time of the human gods, or the humans for that matter. And then they went to uh, deep hibernation for some reason. Each of them went to a different place to hibernate. So we don't know if the dragons killed the great giants, or if the great giants were the ones that kind of formed the world as we know it. We don't know much about that. We just know that they find giant bones, and they know that there were these elder dragons that lived a long time ago. So, at about... Uh, around the year zero, as we talked about, there were six gods. One of them was named Abaddon. I'm not going to go into the details about all, what all the different gods were. They have different sort of spirits. One's water, one's, you know, beauty and illusion and blood, etc. But there was an issue around the year zero because around the year one before Exodus, one BC for all intents and purposes, the god named Abaddon, he said, you know, 
I've got this great power. I'm going to give the humans some of this magic. So he basically bestowed the gift of magic to the races. Humans mostly, but also to all the other races on, on Tyria. And that caused some problems. Because when you give humans something that lets them really easily kill other humans, it causes wars. Terrible, terrible wars. So, Malkior, talk to us about what happened. Uh, around the year zero, when the gods are noticing that these humans are tearing each other apart with magic. Alright. Um, the gods originally gave magic out to kind of the other races, to some of their guardians, known as the Forgotten. But then Abaddon just, like, starts giving magic freely to Willy -nilly. everyone. You have some magic. Yeah. You have some magic. Go ahead, have fun. And with that, chaos was spread across the continent of, Oops. like, the gods lost oh, control of everything and everyone. And that's when the exodus occurred, and they left. In punishing Abaddon, they banished him to the realm of torment, including, like, his followers and kind of his area, Abaddon, was... The Temple of the Six Gods was located in the, kind of in the Crystal Desert where the Desolation is now, in the Crystal Sea, and the so, Temple of the Six Gods. So let's break this down a little bit, because this, this, this is kind of important, because this, this, this Abaddon guy, this god Abaddon, he is very important for a lot of the stuff that happens in the Guild Wars game. So, yep. um, Edwin, when... When the gods, the, the first human king in Ascalon, and we should point out, um, at around this time, the humans arrive from Alona is sort of where they started. I'm sorry, Cantha. Cantha is where the humans originated. Um, and they sort of came up and colonized Alona, which is this area over here. And then they also came up and colonized these parts of... Uh, what's known as Tyr Tyria, the continent of Tyria, on the world Tyria. So Ascalon was one of those kingdoms, Or was another kingdom, and Krita was the third human kingdom. And they were all founded, I believe, around this time, Edwin, is that correct? In the grand scheme of things, they're pretty close. Um... In geologic time. Yeah. So Ascalon's founded around 100 BE before Exodus. They're given tons of, you know, humans are given tons of magical power, around the year one, and then the human king is begging the gods, please take this magic away, it's destroying us. What do the human gods do? They take the magic um, in an area called the Ring of Fire Islands, um, on the west side of the map if you guys are using it, and they create what's called the Bloodstones, which are these well, Originally massive... it, w it was one bloodstone, one giant right. stone. Yeah, that's right. And they broke it up into pieces. Which are... There's four types of... Blood, or there's four bloodstones to represent the four different types of magic. Um, and one keystone, which if the bloodstones are ever put together, you need this keystone. And they put it into what's called Abaddon's Mouth, which is a volcano. And... Because they, nothing ever bad happens if you throw giant magical stones into a volcano. No, <laughs> never. That's the safest place to hide it, really. <laughs> it's not like volcanoes spit things out every once in a while. <laughs> right, and so then the volcano erupts, and the bloodstones get scattered around Tyria. We know one is left near Abaddon's mouth um, on the Ring of Fire. We know one is in the Mamuga jungle. Um, it's called Bloodstone Fen. You can play that in Guild Wars 1. And we don't know where the other ones are, I think. I think uh, there's there... one up near the Char, isn't there? That's right, yeah. One got um, within the Bloodstone Cave and... Sparkfly Swamp, there's one that got launched to the Shiver Peak Mountains. Right. So, here's the thing. This is the, impo this is the rub, though, because the, the, the four, five other human gods heard the first king of Ascalon's plea. Please restrict this magic. It's tearing us apart. So they created these bloodstones, which basically restrict the power that Abaddon had given them. And yeah. Abaddon is pissed because he doesn't let's, like that they're messing around with him. Let, 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 me, let me touch on something real quick. It restricts the power. They didn't take it away entirely. Cause right, that's the, how you the, still the have Mesmer's and Elementalists. Like, the gods are like, Abaddon gave you this magic, but you are the ones who took it out of control. You have to deal with the consequences now. And that's how the, um, the magic gets 
uh, restricted into the six original profession or the five original like casters of mm -hmm. Guild Wars. Right. So what we had was now Abaddon pissed at all five of the other gods because he gave him magic and he liked what was happening. He's it was, it was what it was all going according to plan. So he starts a war against the other gods, or do the other gods start a war against him? I think he starts a war against them. Is that correct? Well, he gives uh, magic to a bunch of people who call themselves the Marganites. That's he not he really basically important. creates his own little army. Right, and these people start worshipping him by themselves, um, and they don't take the other gods as gods. And so he has this army of kind of demonic people so, that he then attacks the gods with. Yeah. That's right. So Abaddon attacks the other gods, and he can actually beat two of the gods by himself, but when all five of the gods work together, they manage to destroy his armies and essentially seal him away in what is known as the Realm of Torment, which essentially, it sounds to me like it's, it's a punishment area, like you're, you screwed up and we can't kill you, but we're going to seal you in this place that is effectively hell, and now you're stuck there, see you later. And then they leave at the year zero. That's the, that's the time at which this, um, this war between the gods takes place. The, the human gods leave. Now there's only five of them. Although I believe later on we get a sixth again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we now have five human gods leaving the plane of Earth, but not stopping influencing it. They still sort of respond to humans um, and anybody who wishes them, I would assume. Um, now they, now every, they use their, now con again. their constructs and their of disciples to minister to the humans instead of being there physically. Right. So that all takes place sort of around the year zero. Abaddon is sealed away and the gods leave. So we talked about how the humans founded Ascalon at about the year 100 BE, and now a th we're basically 1,100 years later, um, at around 1070, that's when Guild Wars takes place. And what has happened is, if we go back to this, uh, this map here, you can take a look at it. There we go. So the humans moved into this area known as Ascalon, and they conquered it, and they founded it around, you know, the, the first human king, etc., as I talked about. But here's the rub. This area here was, n was not empty. They conquered it from the Char, whom you probably know if you've played the first game, and they're a playable race in Guild Wars 2. The homelands of the Char is up north here, but p prior to the humans coming, they had conquered this whole area from lesser races. So the humans push the Char way out, and they take control of this whole area. So now this is kind of like a, a Palestine-Israeli thing here because both of them, after a thousand years, consider this whole area to be their homeland, right? You cannot, you know, convince the humans that Ascalon isn't their home. Like, we've been here for a thousand years. What do you mean it's not our home? And the Char said, but we were there for a thousand years before them. How can you say that's not our home? So you have clearly an irreconcilable difference in this situation. So... You can also see on this map what's known as the Great Northern Wall, which was designed to be a fallback position uh, should the Char ever attack again. And around the year 1070, sure enough, the Char attack again. Now, what makes the Char attack Edwin? Uh, they, there's, they had some poking and prodding that convinces them to go on this uh, offensive, yes? Yeah. Um, it turns out that the Char were being influenced by Abaddon, uh, which is kind of hard um, because he's locked away in another plane of existence but it turns out that he's able to uh, still influence them like you can't like if somebody looks at the human gods they're blinded and they go crazy but if they see that if they talk to their constructs then they're okay ish um, so Abaddon's able to influence the char through these constructs he has called titans mm -hmm. and he gives the char something called uh, the cauldron of the cataclysm which uh, creates what's called the Searing. All right, I... so uh, the Searing. Andrina, tell us about the Searing, because that's, that's where we leave off on Guild Wars 1. Well, the Chad got this cauldron, as you already heard, and they practically let fire rain down, and they destroyed whole Ascalon, and it was a beautiful place before uh, most... Uh, 
tried playing it was and saw the green lands and the happy music and after the searing everything was in ruins and burning and they, they, they didn't recover from that. So the Abaddon deep within his prison on another plane basically comes to the char in the form of not comes to but has his sort of servants come to the char and give them this magic that allows them to destroy the great northern wall and conquer Ascalon for all intents and purposes so the humans are driven back driven way back and the Guild Wars 1 talks about exactly what happens within that. Some of the humans decide to go over the Shiver Peaks as refugees to Krita, the other human uh, civilization. And another chunk of them try to fall back to Ascalon City, the capital. And still more are s sort of refugees in Ebonhawk, which is sort of the last bastion of human, uh, civ um, Ascalonian, I should say, uh, civilization uh, when we get to Guild Wars 2. Because after Ascalon City finally falls... The Char take over the whole area. So this whole area becomes Char, and the last that we know of the human Ascalonians is that some of them went to Krita, and they're now refugees there, and some of them are holed up in Ebonhawk. Now, after the Char finished, you know, taking out Ascalon City, they push down further for the, the, uh, the other human civilization known as Or, which is on this peninsula over here. You'll notice that the peninsula no longer exists. So, um... Let's see. Angelina, tell us what happened at Or. Well, basically, the Char tried to conquer every three uh, human kingdoms at once. Uh, they were in Or. They, they tried to conquer the whole city, and um, the vizier of Or... Basically an advisor, Or. right? Vizier... Advisor, uh, yeah. Advisor to the king? Kilbron. Mm -hmm. Kilbron, exactly. Um, he found some old scrolls with dark magic, and he practically sunk the whole... It was more than a city, the whole peninsula. Uh, he killed the Char, of course, but he killed everyone else, too. From my notes, too, um, and I don't know if this is correct, um, Malkior, I believe that this advisor was essentially working, sort of had been corrupted by Abaddon as well. As as correct, um... Vizier Kilbron, at whatever point in his time, um, became influenced by Abaddon and started worshiping, Ab worshiping Abaddon in secret. And then when the Char came and kind of knocked on the front door, as it turns out, this is all playing in Abaddon's design. The reason he's doing this is for his undead army. So with that, he has Kilbron go down deep under the city, open the Forbidden Scroll. Sort of under the auspices scroll. of we need some kind of great magic to push we need the char some kind back. Of we need some kind of defense to push the char back. He goes and opens the Lost Scroll, reads out the text, and all of Or and the Holy City of Ara, where the gods used to reside, sinks into the ocean and Abaddon gets his revenge on the worshippers of the five gods. So, essentially... Now, Ascalon has been destroyed. It's no longer really a kingdom. Or has been devastated and sunk into the ocean, for all intents and purposes. The, the capital of Or, which was, again, the city of the gods. It's where the, the human gods were when they were on the face, the plane of existence that, that, that Tyria is. That's been sunk into the ocean. So, at this point, the only surviving human civilization is Krita. At least, I'm sorry, on Tyria. There's still humans way down in, in Cantha and Alona, and those are the subjects of separate areas, uh, separate things here. So, um, Krita is the last surviving major human civilization in, at, 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 in uh, Guild Wars 2, as it stands. So I think yes. that kind of covers everything um, with regards to that. Now, it's important to point out that in the Nightfall, Abaddon... Um, is later destroyed, and a new human who helped destroy him takes his power and becomes a, the sixth god. So that's kind of an interesting thing, but we'll get to that. So I think we've kind of covered what happened to the humans in this, and obviously we didn't go into you know, significant detail. Um, if you read, uh, if you read the, the Ghost of Ascalon book, there's a lot more detail in that, um, and probably even more in Destiny's Edge. They go into a lot of the backstory. If you play the Guild Wars game, you'll get a lot more backstory about the, the King Adelburn and uh, Prince Rurik and, and their, you know, etc. So, um, moving on to the Char. 
So the Char are a very interesting people. Like I said, they originally owned all the territory that is known as Ascalon. And they sort of were a nomadic people, many different war bands. They weren't really a united people for a long time until one Char managed to unite basically all of the, the Char race as a single civilization. And he was known as the Con-Ur. The con Air. <laughs> so then the humans arrive, which gives all of the Char a common foe. But unfortunately, the con Ur is assassinated. And I believe it's assassinated by other Char. Does somebody want to back me up on that? I don't have that in my note. I think he's assassinated L- by the another Con-er? Char. Yeah. yeah. I believe he's assassinated by another Char for power. All right. Chat room, come on. Let me know. Yes. Gonna- Myra <laughs> says yes. Somebody else says, Con! So Okay. That guy, <laughs> that guy wins the game. <laughs> so the Con Ur is assassinated. He has four children. And there's no like clear heir to the throne for all intents and purposes here. And so each of the four children becomes Imperator, which is kind of like a general, of his own legion. And the legions are the Flame Legion, Ash Legion, Blood Legion, and Iron Legion. You may recognize those because those are some of the things that you can play in uh, when you choose to char. You get to choose which legion you're in in uh, Guild Wars 2. And that kind of represents part of your personal story. Now, for a very long time, no char is able to unite the four legions permanently. They're always squabbling. They're always bickering. Sometimes there's alliances between legions, but that kind of internal politics isn't what we're talking about here. Um, so this brings us to the Titans. So, um, Edwin, let me find out which button you are. You're that button. Okay. Edwin, um, the Titans we were talking about were sort of, um, messing with, sort of, uh, basically convincing the Char to worship, worship them as gods. So now the Char were like, well, the humans have these gods that are helping them, and now we've got our own gods. And they're the ones that gave them the power to take down the Northern Wall and assault and destroy Ascalon. But at this point, there are some Char that are resisting. Can you tell us about the, the, the Char that didn't like the idea of worshipping these Titans? Well, the issue was more that the Flame Legion was the Legion that was really, uh, that were the first to start worshipping the Titans. Mm-hmm. And because of it, the other Legions kind of fell under them. And the Flame Legion were kind, they were, they were extremely xenophobic. They were uh, very uh, misogynistic, too. Women weren't allowed to participate in fighting at all. They had to stay pretty much in the homeland. And so women really despised the Flame Legion um, outside of the religion. And they actually, you, there was a, a strong female char, basically leads a, re- a rebellion against the Flame Legion and says, you know, the Flame Legion shouldn't be in charge. I don't like the idea of these gods. They seem suspicious. She's put to death, and they use that as an example that women cannot be trusted, and so they basically become, for all intents and purposes, domesticated slaves of the male char, because the Flame Legion says so. Yes. Uh, Whether or not that was Arunet's choice to just way to have lore, that way they didn't have to make female char models for Guild Wars 1, we will never know. (laughs) Well, yeah, I don't know, when they were making Guild Wars 1, I bet they had no idea they were going to uh, make these a playable race later on. They were making them, like, evil and bestial, and, oh, they're bad people, and now all of a sudden they're like, oh, crap, we have to give them a backstory that makes them make sense, and, you know, people can relate to them and everything, so... That's what they looked like in Guild Wars 1. (laughs) They're not very uh, nice looking. (laughs) So, we have basically this situation, and that kind of happens around the same time as, the, the, as Ascalon is falling, basically, is when the, the Flame Legion is now worshipping the, these titans, and they, you know, put the, the females are now second-class citizens in the Char universe. Um, so then, after um, that, here's the problem. The last thing the players do in Guild Wars 1, and Angerino, why don't you tell us about this? The last thing the players do, I believe, is they destroy the Titans in Guild Wars 1. They do. It takes some time, because you have to go all over the place and, and, and search for them, uh, but you do. So the, the Char are left with no Titans anymore. No gods. So they pick the next thing. The Destroyers. So the Flame Legion likes the power that they have, they want to keep 
you know, convincing everyone that they should be in charge. But they're shamans, and you know, they don't they don't have these gods to pray to anymore. So then, plenty of people can say, well, then why should you be in charge? You don't have any special connection with anybody anymore. So what happens with the destroyers? Uh, they try to, to make them as gods. Uh, gods are replaceable, as it seems. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> And the destroyers are minions of Predomus, of the, the first dragon. Primordius. I love that Primordius. name. Yeah, Primordius. Yeah, I love that name. Primordius. Something like that. Well, I think it's because they call him the first dragon. He's like, he's yes, like prime. Primo Primordius. Yeah. Like, prime. He's important. <laughs> Optimus Primordius. Okay. Oh, that would be, <laughs> be the worst. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. He turns into a giant truck. All right. So, anyway, the Titans are destroyed. And because the Titans are destroyed, this gives new rise to people that, can, that, that, to others within the Char that can say, see, they're clearly not gods if they can be destroyed. We shouldn't be worshipping the gods. The Flame Legion shouldn't be in charge. And it basically starts a rebellion that takes about 40 years to finally come to a head, essentially. And there is a, uh, a single female Char, I believe we're, uh, Scorch Razor is probably the name. It's not important, but Scorch Razor, this female Char, leads this rebellion. She's been training this entire cast of female Char in secret. And so the other three legions, bolstered by the strength of huge numbers of female Char now are able to overpower the Flame Legion. Even with all their magic, they now are way outnumbered because the females of the Iron, Ash, and Blood Legions have joined them. And so, finally, the Flame Legion is overthrown, and as a result, their gods have been thrown down, and the Char now have a very atheistic mindset. They, they, they've seen gods appear, they've worshipped them, and then they've seen the fact that they were mistricked and they weren't gods at all. So now the Char have this very like, yeah, gods, sure, we've seen gods. They weren't actually gods. There's no such thing as gods, right? So that's kind of what they, what they feel now. That's their mindset, which is very interesting. So speaking of Primordius and the Great Destroyer, um, Malkior, what can you tell us about the story of the dwarves? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Should I call on someone else? <laughs> no, I, I can just I got the dwarven this. history is very minimal. It is. It's, it's 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 very minimal, but it but it sort of plays an important role in discussing what happens with Primordius. Mm -hmm. Um the dwarves follow the who they call the great dwarf, the one who is the architect of the great forge and showed them Drachnar's Forge, where they currently make their home. In Guild Wars 1, they um, help you as you move throughout the southern Shiver Peaks and ally with you to defend Thunderhead Keep. In return, they um, allow you passage through and, give, and get, provide your ship to the Ring of Fire Island chain where you can go defeat the Titans. Okay, Later so in Eye of the... No Yo, go so ahead. yeah, let's let's jump to the part where the dwarves are fighting the the destroyers and the great destroyer. What happens to them in that fight? Mm. To um, survive Primordius, Primordius's minions, they take the right of the great dwarf, turning all the dwarves taking the right to stone, which was pretty much every single one of them, except like Ogden Stone Healer, who was a member of your party at the time, and realized that the right may. Um, hold back the destroyers for a time, but it would basically be the end of the dwarven race because they would just become defenders, defending living stone golems forever, stone fighting golems under forever. the earth against the the, the destroyer. But mm -hmm. in the Eye of the North, the player um, helps destroy the Great Destroyer. Is that correct? Yes, in destroying the Great Destroyer. And it the, awake be... the awakening of Primordus is delayed several years. Right, because the Great Destroyer, who's this threat throughout, um, you know, Eye of the North, he is uh, actually one of the greatest generals of Primordius. So when he is destroyed, when he is thrown down, Primordius, who had planned to come out, you know, wake up earlier, his, his, his plans are dashed, and it takes longer for Primordius to wake up. So that's sort of an important step in talking about the history of the dragons. The Primordius is set back 
a little bit by the dwarves doing this sort of heroic sacrifice where they basically say, our race is about to become extinct in order to try and stop this evil that is coming from under the ground. And so that kind of brings us to discussion of the dragons, and through the dragons we can talk about all the other races. So let me see if I got this correct. Edwin, talk to us about... Um, the Primordius and his relationship with uh, basically the Asura showing up on the scene. Right, so while Primordius is still stirring, I guess, he, uh, his, drag, or his, cha- his highest champion, the Great Destroyer, awakens and starts to wreak havoc underground, which is very important for the doors because they're highly underground. But the Azura, their entire civilization is underground. Nobody they even knew the- that they existed. They've been underground for so long. Right, that nobody knew they existed, nobody knew anything about them. And all of a sudden, the Great Destroyer shows up, and they don't have the power to fight him or defeat him, even with their golems. And so they end up rising above the Earth, um, over towards the Tarnish Coast, where the Mamuga Jungle is. And they uh, they set up Broad Assum and have to start communicating with the other races, but they're not very nice, and they kind of look down upon everybody. They do. I love the way that they talk in the the book that I've read. I mean, they're just like, they're so condescending. Like, even you should be able to see that kind of a thing, like, all the time. And they have a term for non-Asura that they call, you know, people Buka. Buka. And it's kind of like, it kind of reminded me of the way the Chinese see outsiders, you know, for a Mm. long time. Um, and I think some of the Chinese still do, but for a long time, for huge chunks Japanese of history, too. the Japanese, for huge chunks of history as yep. well, would see outsiders as sort of below them. They had a very racist opinion. It's not that they were xenophobic per se. They were, well, maybe they were. So, anyway, so the Asura, who uh, essentially made um, you know, their home underground, are, are basically forced out of the earth because Primordius' minions move through the caverns under the earth. And they wind up using the gate network that the Asura have set up, which are basically teleportation gates. You walk in one gate, you come out hundreds and hundreds of miles away somewhere else. And the Asura are also, it should be pointed out, very, very intelligent, very technological. They they sort of have a, a version of technology that's based entirely around magic which is very interesting. But they make very impressive gadgets and tools and things, and they love to tinker and invent things. They're kind of the, the, the gnomes of Guild Wars 2, but way, way cooler because of yeah. their horrible <laughs> racism. It just makes them yes, so much more awesome. Indeed. <laughs> it's like, we are better than everyone else, whole- and, we, and we will let you know it. And Do we, even- they'll, Go they'll ahead, like uh, Andrea. Race? Yeah. It's like... You take um, Rodney McKay from Stargate Universe. Mm-hmm. Um, no, was it Universe? Stargate Atlantis. And you make him an entire race. Yeah. He, he was awful. I love this quote. <laughs> I found this in one of the lore pieces I was looking up. The Asura mostly lived underground right up until the destroyers popped up and made live and underground mutually exclusive. <laughs> This is perfect. That's exactly what happened. But here's the thing. The Asura had these gates, like I'm talking about, you know, these Asura gates that Mm -hmm. you can use to travel from one place to another underground. When Primordius woke up, it turns out that they were using him as basically a power source for their major central transfer area. So usually to get from one place to another, you'd go through a gate that would take you to this central transfer area, and then that center, it's like Grand Central Station in New York City, right? All play, you know, all different tracks lead to Grand Central, and then you can go anywhere from there. That's kind of what this central transfer network was, and they were, they put it right next to Primordius, because they're like, hey, there's this source of magical energy here. Don't know what it is, but let's to, let's use it. And so Primordius mm-hmm. wakes up and he's like, oh, excellent. A system of gates that I can use to get all of my minions to conquer the world. <laughs> so he's using these gates to get through all of the caverns all over the world. And that's why the Asura have to run once they lose the central transfer because now none of their homes are safe because those gates go everywhere. So um, some other important information about the Asura. They typically live about 5 to 10% longer than humans. Um, they have this interesting religion known as the internal alchemy. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, the, the best way to put it probably is that they, they believe that the world and all of the whole universe is basically a giant machine and that we are, everyone in it is sort of a part of the great machine for all intents and purposes. And um, it is sad when parts wear out 
<laughs> for all intents and purposes. Yes. But, uh, but you know, they can be replaced, but... is how they say it. <laughs> you can replace parts. So We can rebuild it. We have the technology. Exactly. <laughs> so... That's that's the assurance. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how they uh, they play out. Before I read the Ghost of Ascalon, I wasn't really considering making an Asura, and now I want to be an Asura just so I can call people Buka. It's just <laughs> I just wanted to have a have a have a free reign to 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 basically be an asshole towards anybody who else is not Asura. Oh, hey, I'm role playing here. I'm role playing. <laughs> I I could see someone like. Not familiar with Guild Wars 2, coming in, getting wrecked in PvP, getting called a Buka, and seeing it as some kind of <laughs> new curse or something. Oh, that'd be a great meme. <laughs> Just like that, people say frack now. They'd be like <laughs> Buka. <laughs> oh man. Okay. <clears throat> Back on track. So, that's pretty much, uh, you know, the, the main backstory of the Asura. We don't know as much about them as we do as about the humans and the Char, obviously, because only the Eye of the North dealt with the Asura at all, and it really didn't deal with them too much. They weren't the focus of, of that particular game. So, uh, that's Primordius. He's causing problems for the Asura, and obviously for the Dwarves as well. Zaitan is the next dragon we're going to talk about here. Uh, Zaitan is the undead dragon. He basically was sleeping underneath Or. Or, again, remember, is the sort of peninsula that was where the, the city of the gods was, Ara. And that's where the corrupted advisor blew up the whole peninsula, you know, basically at the behest of Abaddon for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. So Zaitan's been sleeping underneath this thing. So once Or sunk into the sea... I don't know, maybe it kind of woke him up a little bit, hit his alarm clock, because then, you know, 100 years later or what have you, somewhere between what's, Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2... What's that itch? Yeah, what was <laughs> that? You know, 100 years later, he wakes up and goes, ah, there's something on my back. He raises the entire peninsula out of the ocean again. So it was sunk by that great catastrophe that the advisor caused, and then Zaitan brings it back to the surface. Now, you can imagine... If you have a peninsula coming back to the surface of an ocean, that's going to displace a ton of water. And as that happens, it causes massive flooding and tidal waves and earthquakes all over the place and basically obliterates Lion Arch. Lion's Arch. As you obliterates know, everything obliterates everything. Obliterates everything. I mean, the battle islands are sunk from Guild Wars 1. Basically, anything that's not present in Guild Wars 2 that was present and near a coast in Guild Wars 1, the reason it's not there anymore is because Zaitan raised up the ruins of Ore. So, uh, on this yeah, map... it's like, yay, now we can go underwater. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you can go underwater before, but now that he raised up Ore, you can do it. So this map, obviously, is not too up-to-date with Guild Wars 2 because it still shows Ore as being sunk underground, but this whole area would be land in uh, Guild Wars 2. So Zaitan wakes up, and he then basically takes all of the inhabitants of Or, the dead, dead people that died when Or was sunk to the ground, and he basically raises them as, as undead minions. And he now has an army of all the, ch the humans and Char that died at Or, and he also has all these ships that have been shipwrecked because of the, the, the tidal waves, and throughout time, and the navy that Or had is all gone, but now he raises all those ships up from underwater, and he then crews them with undead crew, and now he controls the ocean. He has a navy, and he has an army, and Zaitan the dragon now controls the ocean. And at this point, there is no longer any contact between Cantha, this continent way down here, and uh, Tyria, the continent way up here, because Zaitan is basically controlling the ocean. There's no ships that go outside of the uh, Sea of Sorrows, because he will destroy them. So... That is a very interesting uh, piece there. Uh, he's got his own navy. I like that. A dragon with a navy. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't think a dragon would need a navy, but he has a navy. With an undead navy. Undead navy. Dar, har, wildy <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, um, let's see. Angerina, why don't you talk to us about Jormag, the ice dragon. I like that name. I like that name, too. Um, Jomak is way, way in the north. He's the ice dragon uh, who can turn people into to something like ice zombies. Yeah, ice minions or something. That, yeah, every time the, the non get drunk and, hey, I'm gonna be Jomak, or, or some of his um, little dragons that help him. <laughs> uh, 
they just come back as ice zombies. It kind of has a George R.R. R. Martin feel, like the others in uh, oh, The Song God. of Ice and Fire. Like, yes. you go to yeah. fight them, and instead you die and come back as one of them. Uh, that, that just occurred to me now. So, Jormag, uh, let's look at the map here. He originally was resting way up in the north, and it's not even really shown on this yep. map. He wakes up, and he starts making this army of ice minions, you know, using lesser races. And, and the Norn, who are... Uh, let's talk about the Norn before we jump into what's going on here. The Norn are a race of eight-foot-tall people who can't decide whether they want to be Native Americans, Vikings, or bears. And so they settle for going back and forth between all three. <laughs> so Excellent summary. It really is. I don't think any more really needs to be said. So... Um, the other thing that, that really ties directly into the Norn is they don't have gods per se, but they have sort of a form of a set of, set of demigods representing nature spirits that they are in direct contact with and that work directly with them. And those nature spirits have their own personal they champions. them specifically. Yeah. So, you know, each, each Norn sort of has a personal connection with one of these nature spirits, and the greatest heroes have sort of direct connections with these nature spirits of, like, you know, bear and wolf and raven, etc. And so, as soon as Jormag comes up, and, and the nature spirits recognize that there's a problem north of where they are. So let's jump back to the map here so you can see what I'm talking about. So, way up here in the north, Jormag arises, and he breaks a bunch of glaciers, and it floods uh, some of the far shiver peaks here a little bit. Um, and so a bunch of the greatest Norn heroes, which, by the way, let me try to sum up the way that Norn work. Okay, you got ten char charging you over that way. The Norn in your group will go, Aha! A great way to die! And charge into glorious battle. <laughs> he doesn't care. As long as somebody sings about what he does, they will, they will boast as as of somebody. my great triumph. Exactly. Or, or whatever. Should I die? They will still sing. They will sing of me. me. They will make great songs. To give you an idea, <laughs> one of the Norns in the book, in, in Ghosts of Ascalon, like, tries to kill somebody because they feel like uh, he did not give his cousin a great enough song about her death. <laughs> like, what? That's just crazy. So, anyway. Well, they're drunk all the time. They're that's, drunk all the time. Issue. That's the other thing. Is Now I really want to make a Norn, because I want to be that, <laughs> that a-hole who Leroy Jenkins everything for glory. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so, anyway... So a lot of the Norns hear that there's this evil ice dragon, and there's this bad stuff happening up north, so the greatest heroes of the Norn all charge off north to defeat it. None of them come back. And that is very upsetting, because the spirits can feel when their champions die. So Owl and, and, uh, and Wolverine, they can feel their champions dying. They can feel that they're losing contact with them. And more, uh, over time, they, so Norn don't come back, more Norn go to fight Jormog. And the spirits realize that if they don't do something, the Norn are going to become extinct because they're all going to just rush off north to try to fight this evil that they cannot defeat. So, talk to us, uh, Jared, what happens after that, um, after the spirits realize they have to do something? Right, so the spirits are really worried, and so they actually band together um, to help save the Norn while they fight like a last ditch effort, um, like Master Chief does in every Halo game. Where <laughs> everyone else run away. I'll the kill spirits 50, of the Norn to Master Chief. <laughs> it's okay. a good, I mean, every every Marine runs away. Master Chief kills fifty thousand Covenant. Kills um, <laughs> one. Kills yeah. one. He's and Neo. so during this, the spirits are fighting, and as the Norn get away. Um, they find out that their owl spirit has been slain, and it's terrible to one of their gods. Yeah, I mean, it's a really sad story, and really, basically, the, the spirits convince that, actually, uh, there, there's a great sort of Norn hero who goes off with all the spirits to try and fight Jormog, and the best that he can do is to cut one of Jormog's fangs free and bring it back. And that's, I think, at the point at which the spirits go... Wow, if that's the best that we can do, clearly we need We're to run away. Trouble. Yeah, it's run away time. And the Norn won't do it unless we tell them to. So the spirits convince the Norn to run away and take the tooth with them. And they leave behind some of the spirits that have lost the most 
you know, champions and, and Norn. So Owl, Wolverine, and Eagle, amongst others, stay behind and sort of sacrifice themselves to buy we'll time for back, the Exodus. Get the heck out of here. Exactly. So the Norn relocate south, and I'll bring up the map again because this is kind of uh, interesting. The Norn, who used to be up here, relocate south to the area that is now basically empty because this used to be all dwarf land. But the dwarves are now all stone underground fighting Primordius' minions forever, basically. So now they've relocated to this area here, and they form a new city known as Holbrek. And the idea is they're going to train and become strong enough to, uh, you know, before they go back and fight Jormag. So the spirits have brought them down here away from Jormag so they can get strong again and then go take out Jormag eventually. And so that's sort of the, the, the place at which we start in Guild Wars 2. Um, yes, stoned underground. That's what I said. The dwarves are stoned underground. They've got plenty of weed. They're never coming back out. So That's why we never see them again. That's why we never see them again. <laughs> so let me see. I don't think I missed anything. They took the fang. They brought it down. So actually, if you go to Holbrek, that's kind of cool. You're going to see the fang of Jormog sort of displayed prominently in the center of, of Holbrek. And I think you can actually and see that in one of the videos. big. It's huge. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, <laughs> that's the thing's tooth. Um, Let me see if I can I'm find scared. an image of it. Yeah. I, I have an image of it. I like, you know, when they had... Um, Fang of Jormag brings nothing from Google Image Search. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe you just search for Holbrecht. Or Holbrecht. I has <laughs> Alex Albrecht in Holbrecht. Um, <laughs> his fang is so, oh my god, worship the fang? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Worship the fang. Oh, gracious. Uh, okay. Uh, da, da, da. So, um, conclusion... Dragons are assholes. <laughs> That's what I put in my notes. Oh, you found a fang. Okay, here's, here's an image. Let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, to give you an idea of scale. Oh, there it is! <laughs> it's like, wait, the Norn are like eight feet tall. Yeah, so yeah. That's the Norn eight are eight Norn. feet tall, so those are eight foot that's, tall Norn, and that's Let's one say fang. that's like an 80 to 100 foot tooth. Yeah. <laughs> now we're dealing with God knows how many feet dragon. Yeah, yeah, so that happened. That's the well, ice probably. dragon. Well, Krakatoric's wings are said to spread from horizon to horizon, so I don't, I don't know. These things. And are... we're supposed to fight that? God. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with your animations, or internet. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they've shown us the other dragons that they've shown us, and they've been able to stress that those were small dragons. I have no idea how they're going to do the big dragons, the elder dragons. Oh yeah, to quaddle flying from like the ice up onto that like entire mountain, and like that, yeah. that was gigantic, and that was a baby. <laughs> I know it was. Oh, I can't wait to see what happens. So that's sort of that's that's most of the races here. Now we come to the Silvari. Now you probably a lot of you know about the Silvari, but um, here's here's what happened. There was a human soldier that found a seed, basically the size of his fist, in a cave. And we don't know anything other than that, as far as I can tell. We don't know where the seed came from. We don't know how it became sentient. But for all intents and purposes, he found this seed to a tree and he planted it. And the tree grew, and he became friendly with a centaur. And the centaur's name was Venturi. Venturi? Is it Venturi? Tari. Venturi. Venturi. No, not, not Venturi. Um, <clears throat> not Ace Venturi. So, uh, Venturi. It might, it, that, that might be a reference, though. I never considered that. Or <laughs> Veginari from Discworld. Ah, I haven't read Discworld. I've been meaning to. It's on my list. It's on my list. Ooh, interesting. So, the Silvari are basically products of this tree, this huge tree that, that grew out of this seed. Now, Ventari sort of communicated with the tree or, or just hung around and spoke out loud with the tree because the tree was very influenced by this centaur named Ventari. And Ventari sort of wrote down all of his principles. He's kind of like a great philosopher, right? And he wrote down all of his principles on this tablet before he died. Now, after he dies... And some about 25 years before Guild Wars 2 takes place, the tree finally basically buds with these fruit, egg, bulb things. And when those open, the Silvari walk out. They're humanoid-looking things that are actually made up of plants, plant matter. They are plants, for all intents and purposes. They still seem to eat meat, based on the book here. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the characters goes, wait... 
Silvari eat meat? They're like, yeah, there's tons of plants that eat meat. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, so they eat meat. They apparently have a digestive system. They're, they only look humanoid because the pale tree wanted them to be able to interact with humans, and so it made them look humanoid so that they would interact with humans. But they are in no way humans that are actually just turned into plants. They're plants that just look like humans. They're very, very different. Now, what's very interesting about how the Savari work, uh, does somebody want to talk to us about the dream and how the dream gives them knowledge? Oh. Okay, so... Who wants to take it? Uh, oh, oh, I will. So, um... Go for it. <laughs> It's a very I love this. It's abstract. A really cool... It's a very abstract subject. Right. You've got telepathic <laughs> plants. That's all there is to it. They're telepathic plants, really. So, well, well, think, think Avatar. It's like everything in the world is connected. Yeah, yeah. But it, except That's it's it wireless. From. Avatar had those like things you had to plug in, but this is like wireless. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, oh God, I'm gonna go back only because I watched the movie recently. Because the Navi connect with the world around them, everything has a spirit, everything has a life force, and everything is interweaved together. It was only the humans that went through the avatars that tried to connect that with them. That's only because I watched the movie within the last couple right. of weeks. So anyway, so the Silvari, what's known as the Firstborn, the first is at 13, I think, Silvari descend from the Pale Tree, and, the mem and, and they basically come into the world fully grown. They don't come as children, per se, and they come with a huge amount of knowledge. They know how to speak, they know about the philosophies of Ventari, and they know about... Um, the dragons dis basically destroy, you know, causing problems in the world, but they don't know too much more than that, and basically the firstborn have to slowly experience the world, and everything that Silvari experience is sort of passed back to the Pale Tree and experienced by the new generation of, Sil of Silvari that are growing at that time through a dream, essentially, what they call the dream. Um, so... Silvari that are in, for all intents and purposes, the womb, the bulb, as they are growing in the bulb, they experience some experiences of the Silvari that are out in the waking world. And so that's where they get their knowledge from. And they usually attend, and they don't really know specific things either. So uh, they don't, like, they can't tell you exactly what happened here because they saw it through somebody else's eyes. They just gain knowledge. They know that, you know, this is a sword. This is how you fight with it. You know, they, they come into being with that knowledge, with that experience, but they don't know the details. So they know how to f fight with a sword. You know, they can actually fight with a sword from the beginning, but they don't know, you know, who makes the sword or the name of the person that gave that specific sword that they learned how to fight with, etc. So they don't have those specific memories, but they do come with memories. Now, they believe that it's their destiny to fight the Elder Dragons, and that's why they're there, because they, in this dream, they sort of have this concept of the, this dark shadow over the world, and when they awake, they find the dragons here and destroying everything. So they sort of feel that it's their destiny to fight the Elder Dragons. In addition... The backstory that I think that we learn somewhat in Guild Wars 2 is very interesting. Does anybody know about the Nightmare Faction? Yes. Yes, Nightmare Court. That I do know. All right, talk to us about the Nightmare. All right. First off, within a dream, there is always also a Nightmare at some point in time. So the Nightmare is kind of the dark portion of the Dream of Dreams. And it takes some dark for the dream to exist... So with that, the very first secondborn, Kadern, he, he, he grew up of the pale tree, and he thought he was firstborn. So at first, he was just like a whiny little child. It's like, why can't I be <laughs> as important as you guys? And then with that, he saw some, the darkness of the world and uh, some of the conflict that arose, how um, the Asura had experimented on one of his friends I'm trying to remember which one it was uh, specifics aren't aren't important <laughs> Duh. Okay. I'm sure we'll get more specifics as we get into yeah. the game well the Asura they saw the Savari come out and they're like oh yay test subjects <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and so they went all crazy and um, Kadarin saw one of his friends die and that kinda was the last thing to lead him to the dark side and, and what's interesting is I don't think it's even necessarily the dark side per it's se. Not. Because mm -mm. what happened was 
the Ventari tablet, this sort of great philosopher Ventari, basically let this tablet of sort of basic things, sort of like Aristotle, like the golden rule, do unto others and blah, 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 you know, be good, this is how you make a good society. The thing is, this, this guy that you're talking about, this second-born dude said, well, we'd be a lot more efficient at fighting the Elder Dragons if we weren't restricted by the civility of this tablet, by these principles. So all of the other Silvari were like, no, we have to go abide by the tablet. Ventari was, was, was very smart, and he knew about making a very civil and good society. And he's like, no, the ends justify the means, is basically the, the mentality of the nightmare faction within Silvari. They're basically <laughs> That's saying, what makes that's what makes the Nightmare Corps so cool. Yeah, because they're not evil. They are also their goal is also to destroy the Elder Dragons. They're trying to free the Silvari from, from the these restrictions. restrictions of the tablet, exactly. so they can be more than Silvari were ever intended to be. Yeah, more than just sort of, you know, stuck under the restrictions of this tablet because he keeps saying to himself, man, it would be a lot easier to fight the dragons if we didn't have these restrictions that we had here. Like, you know, so uh, I don't know examples, but basically that's the main thing. So you basically I think they just needed like an evil Silvari faction. But I like how they did it so that you can understand how they're evil. They're not just evil for the sake of we need even evil bad guy. They like have an understandable nature behind them and i really like that yeah the bird of doom is nomming me sorry so <laughs> i think um i think i mean that's that's uh, i think covers as much as i can think of about the silvara anybody have anything to jump in and add with them well the one thing we know about the seed is it was pale and then the tree's pale like it seems to be a theme that runs through but we don't mm -hmm. really know why yet yeah i know that the silvara are very vibrant in their color yeah, it's very interesting. We'll have to see if they give us any more backstory on where the hell the pale tree came from, because we really we don't know other than, you know, this human soldier found this thing in a cave, and he planted it, and it grew into the pale tree, and the pale tree is kind of sentient. Uh, so, go figure. Oh, hey, dog. I got a dog. So, um... They, they just had to pull out and edge your That's all they did. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so that's kind of the backstory between all of the races. So what that means, though, is that the Silvari are very curious. Like, they also don't have the same kind of emotions that humans have. And they, again, this book does a fantastic job of showing you the, the sort of mentality of a lot of the races. Because the Silvari in this book will, 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 will care about the feelings of humans, but they will not know about them. So they'll make so many faux pas where they're just asking questions, like kind of like a child would, without knowing that that question is incredibly offensive, or without knowing that what they're doing is going to make people upset. Like, oh, you mean you didn't want me to raise your friend from the dead as an undead minion of mine? Uh. Oh, I can see how that would be very offensive. I'm so sorry. But they don't think about that ahead of time because they don't understand human emotions until they experience them for the first time, really. Uh, well, not that they experience them, until they realize, until another human shows them, hey, I'm angry because of this. And then they go, oh, I see now. I probably shouldn't have done that. So it's a very interesting sort of, how to put it, curious, curious uh, mischief. Oh. Like, unintentional oh, mischief. Or unin unintentional offense. It's, it's accidental offen offense all the time. It's very interesting. Um, so, okay, any... any Final words that you guys uh, want to talk about? Anything in the uh, chat room? Did, did you guys have anything that were um, uh, you think we maybe missed or that you didn't understand about what we were talking about here? Uh, let's see if they have any any dog equals Silvari. Kind of like yeah, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I think it's like Mr. Data from Star Trek. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> That's close. Um, oh, and I, we didn't really talk about the Norns um, relationship with the char which is actually kind of cool basically the char when they were expanding their borders and conquering ascalon they come into contact with the norn and the norn just kicked the ever living out of them and the char go oh okay but the norn also you know they respect the they, they sort of both sides have a respect that was for a the, good fight exactly you strong kitty <laughs> both sides have this weird respect for each other they go oh we both share one thing in common. We like to beat the f*** out of things. And so... 
<laughs> and so they sort of have this truce that goes, you know, for, for until the game comes out. And I don't think that it, it breaks, obviously, when the game comes out. But um, that's sort of where they stand when they contact each other. And obviously the Asura and the Silvari are kind of neutral towards everybody. They didn't have any wars. But, you know, the Norn look human. So you'd think that maybe they'd also be at war, but they're not. So, and mostly because both sides are, you know, like, they're both big and they both like to hit things. Um, all right. So what is Crowley? Crow- Crow- What's Crowkey? Crocatoric. Crocatoric. Oh, that's right. You missed the dragon. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I forgot about a dragon. Uh, talk to us about Crocatoric. Crocatoric <laughs> uh, is the crystal dragon. And without going too much into spoilers from Edge of Destiny, Crocatoric arose from, I forget the name of the mountain range, basically up in the northern Char homelands, and got real pissed, and just flew over all of Ascalon, leaving this giant star over the land called the Dragon Brand. And everywhere that Krakatoa flew just corrupted the land under her, and with that, all the wildlife was corrupted, all the plant life was corrupted, everything wanting to serve Crocatory. And then Crocatory lands in the crystal kind desert. Of the crystal desert, specifically where Glint was. Glint being the dra- the one of the smaller dragons, not not one of these giant primordial dragons, but Glint wasn't just an elder dragon. That existed during the time of the Forgotten and the Gods. She was a caretaker of the Forgotten. And so, with that, she's the one who offered the Flame Seeker prophecies in the original. Alright, uh, you're going board. too deep. You're going too deep. We gotta back up. We must not go deeper. So, I'm we'll trying to find. I'm trying to find a dang picture. But anyway, um, suffice it to say, what happens when Kalkatoric flies over. This area of Ascalon and all the way down to the Crystal Desert, as Krakatoric flies over it, without even trying, it converts everything underneath it to crystal and evil. So plants and the ground and everything turns into this crystalline form. And because we all know jewelry is evil. Yes. So this crystalline Jewelry is very evil. This crystalline form. So there's this huge dragon brand is what it's called. And there's this big line down sort of the eastern side of Ascalon going all the way down to the Crystal Desert. And the whole thing is kind of reminds me of in um, the Burning Crusade. Do you remember in um, the the Blood Elf area they have that big line of undead sort of thing down the middle of the map? I'm expecting yeah. it's going to be something like that. It's this area where you walk into it, and it's just one step, you're in regular land, and the next step, you're in evil crystal land, right? So Pretty much. That's, uh, that's the other dragon that we don't know about. So we talked about Jormag way up here in the north chasing the Norn. We talked about Krakatora creating the dragon brand and going down in the crystal desert. We talked about Zaitan raising ore from the ruins and bringing, that, bringing ore back to the surface. And we talked about Primordius. Um, in his lair up here, basically still kind of under the earth, but awake and doing some evil stuff. Um, mm. So that's uh, that's all those dragons there. Uh, oh, we got a good picture of the dragon brand on this on this page here. Maybe I can give you. A... There we go. That's the that's the image that I wanted, but I got a stupid website. So here it is. So you can see there's this huge line all the way down Ascalon, all the way down to the dragon brand, um, and and that is you know it's a big problem. So. But he misses everything important, which is the best part. Yeah, yeah he does. <laughs> what do you want? Oh. Birds, uh, Bird says, feed me. <laughs> the dog is howling at me for some reason. All right. Oh, the dog. Yeah, you no, see, she, she obviously wasn't aiming for anything important except her end she's destination. She's she wants hungry. to be on the show. All right. She, I, so she wants up. me to wrap up the show, but we got one more thing to do before we get done here. <laughs> Stop biting my chair. Oh my god, it's ruining all the things. So, let's talk about the Ghost of Ascalon. How, which, of you, which of you guys have read this? Everybody? Uh, yes. It's yes. been a while, though. All right. So, um, Angelina, why don't you start us off with your thoughts of the, about the Ghost of Ascalon? Um, 
I just bought the books because I, I, I always need to have a book with me and I like to go into deep lore and it will seem to have oh, a lot I should of point lore. Out, what mm -hmm. I would like to do is do a spoiler free review yep. first and then we'll do a spoilerific review after that for people who have read it so we can talk yes. about our thoughts freely afterwards. Yes, I'll have time to reread it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean right now. I mean, right now, we'll, we'll oh, talk crap. about it without spoilers, if you can, as much as possible. And then Gotta afterwards, we can go back and talk about it again and talk with spoilers if you wanted to have specific examples about things. So let's try and do non-spoiler right now. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Don't throw the camera on me. I'm seriously going to go get my book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Angelina, so go ahead. Basically, it's about the ghosts of Ascalon. Like the title says, because Ascalon is completely turned into ghosts by the king who put the whole fire on the whole land, turning everything into ghosts. And they try to recover something from Escalon. And the faux fire is a very camp. interesting story. And, and, and the book yeah. tells sort of the whole story, and I don't want to spoil it for people who don't know about the faux fire. It's a very interesting sort of story that we didn't talk about today. And it talks about how, about the Char trying to take over Ascalon and the whole searing and everything. But, um... Let's talk about just your thoughts. Like, was it a good book? Did it give you good information? Were you happy with it? What did, what, what, what's, your, what's your thought? I was happy with it because it showed how the, the races could interact with each other and how some humans actually try to get along with each other, with the Char and the Azura and so on, and some just don't. Some just want humans are humans and you are you, you are fuzzy and you are small and you are too tall and I don't like you. <laughs> and so I, and it was interesting. What did you think of the writing? Was the writing good? Was the plot well written? The plot was good. The writing, I think there were some mistakes with names. I, I remember I... I yeah, was it, I thought so too. Was it? I thought it said Fry. Fry was one of the um, one of the important Char heroes, and then I'm reading the wiki, and it calls him Pry, like P R Y E, instead Pyre. of F R Y E. Pyre, P Y R E, Pyre Fierce Shot. Yeah, but did it? Did, wasn't it spelled with an F in the book? I I don't know. I just know this book had suboptimal writing in some places. Yeah. Yeah. Some some names were out of place, uh, like like switched around. Uh, Divinity's Reach and Lion's Arch was was switched around a few times. I didn't notice that actually. Maybe I got uh, the better yeah. version. <laughs> well, no, that was before you were familiar. No, I mean I just read it this weekend. I didn't notice oh, that okay. it was switched around too much. I think um, it's only a couple instances within the middle. It's nothing okay. big. Maybe I skipped over it. Uh, well, I mean, not skipped over it. just didn't, it was moving too fast, so I just assumed I knew what they were talking about. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's right. So, um, so I, th I, I thought that the, it did a good job sort of introducing the characters. You could really see what they were doing with the, um, with the, the classes. I mean, they had one that was out and out. They called her a necromancer. And then mm -hmm. there was another one that was clearly a thief, but they didn't quite... I think they made, maybe named him once. And then they had a couple of warriors. And they didn't ever have... They referenced an elementalist at one point, but we never saw an elementalist in action in the book. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting that you could see some very clear references to the... For the, to the and then, uh, of course, um, a lot of people think that the queen of the humans of Krita is actually a mesmer, but I haven't gotten to uh, the second book yet, and I think that's where that is alluded to. Um, mm. So we'll have, to, we'll have to see about that. But that's a very interesting way of showing the professions as being, uh, you know, something... And then you have um, the engineer actually is in there very clearly, as one of the Asura mm. is clearly an engineer. <laughs> But every Azura is an engineer in the sense that they all love making golems mm -hmm. to some extent. True. But I think this one was clearly an engineer because he always had those potions, you know, that he'd pull yeah. out whenever you needed them and, uh, and, 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 and different explosive things and, and all kinds of stuff. So, um, so, I, I, so, so the plot sort of gives you a very good introduction where you start in a sort of – it's kind of a dungeon crawly – thing where you know mm -hmm. they start off and they're oh, yeah. sort of exploring a tomb and the whole story is sort of a dungeon crawl but the first one's a mini dungeon crawl and then they get the gang together for a dungeon crawl somewhere else and i think they did a very good job of having the characters obviously the characters in this book are not all 
you know, really good friends and like, let's go steal something together because we all love each other. It's more like, well, we no, have this to is, do this. This is a mercenary group. A mercenary yeah. group of people that have to do it. And they don't like each other, but they're only, they're only working together because they, they, they need to in order to get this done. So I thought that brought a lot of good internal strife to the story and was able to resolve a lot of really interesting issues there and sort of showed the characters develop over time as they kind of hated each other a little less. <laughs> it's to some extent, in some cases. Or budding interspecies friendships, too, yeah. that hadn't been there before. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And obviously what they do in this book has a huge impact on the whole world of, of Guild Wars 2, for all intents and purposes. Uh, they, they basically cause one of the major things that makes the second game what it is. And I'm not going to go any deeper into that while we're still talking non-spoilers here. Um, but I'm trying to think of anything else that I can say about it without giving things away. Um, what else? You know, one thing, actually, I have a, a quote here that I thought was odd. At the bottom of page 78... They start describing the char, and it says the term most people use when describing the char was, quote, feline, unquote. But beyond a few basic attributes, there were no kin to any cat Dougal had, ver had ever seen. They were very, they were huge, half again as tall as a man, not as massive as a Norn, but still towering against a single human. Now, at this point, that implies that the char are about nine feet tall, and that the Norn are even bigger than that, when I think the Norn are actually shorter than that. <laughs> so I wonder if, uh, where, where they got it, these numbers it, it from. It depends, it depends if the char is standing straight up, because True. most, most male char, um, Hunch over. Have, have yeah. hunched backs, yes. Yeah. And I forget exactly why, and I'm not about to try and look it up. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of, uh, that kind of actually shocked me, because at that time I'm like, oh, I kind of didn't realize the Norn were quite that tall. I thought they were like six and a half, seven feet tall, but I think the Norn are routinely eight feet tall, so that's, that's well, a very like, different. I think they're on average like nine-ish feet, yeah. and the thing is that the, the thing is that the, uh, the Char, they're not necessarily as tall, or they're not, they're not as bulky, really. Like, they have very big chests um, and arms, but they're very feline-like, so they're very slender. Yeah. Whereas the Norn is just like a large buff human. Yeah. So they'd be like thicker arms and thicker legs, which I think is kind of what they're leading to is massive more than height. Yeah, that's true too. Um, and they had the Norn in the book, you know, changing into bear or, or snow leopard or something. They, they, they oh, changed yeah. into their sort of animal spirit form, which was kind of cool. And obviously we know that that's going to be in the game as one of the elite skills that you can get if you're a Norn. You can use an elite racial skill that lets you turn into uh, your spirit animal. Um, and that's, that's pretty awesome. So that came into play a couple of times. Um, like I said, when we were talking about the Asura, they, they, it gave a very interesting sort of concept about them. Um, I think we, we're going to probably stop the non-spoiler here because there's a lot of specific things I'd like to talk about. Um, so if you have not read the book and you don't want spoilers, this is the point at which the show is over for you. So um, have a good time and come back again if you want to hear us talk about it after you've read it. <clears throat> I'll give you five seconds. All right, if you're still in game and unable to press the pause button, then you're going to get spoiled. So I thought it was pretty amazing, for example, when um, the Asura... Now I'm forgetting all the characters' names already. Who's the Asura that they meet and they, that goes to them? Cranks. 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 No. Yeah. Is it, Cranks is the first one, right? What's the second one? There's the second one. Cranks was the first one that they hired or something? Uh, no. No, the first one they hired is... Clag. Clag. Sorry, so Clag. Cranks. Yeah, no, it's Cranks. Cranks. Cranks is the well, good Clag was the one leading the first group. Yeah, Clag was the bad guy. Bad Asura. So the good Asura. Um, I really like how they had Dougal, the human, that the, basically the narrator of the story, suddenly realize what Clax had given up to go on this mission for the vigil and for, for you know, to, to, to do everything that they needed to do. It, it, it's very, I thought that was a really interesting moment where all of a sudden he kind of has this crystal clear image of, oh my god, I forgot how much the Asura care about their lab and their work, and this guy mm -hmm. threw it all away to come on this mission with us, and he suddenly gets a huge amount of respect for him, to the point where he basically wants to console him and says, here, you can keep this ancient artifact of your people, I don't need it, I know it's worth a lot, but you can hold on to it for me. Yeah. <laughs> that was a really powerful moment, I thought. 
Is there any other parts that you guys thought were really uh, cool that you liked a lot? Well, I, when <laughs> when Cranks uh, takes that golem heart and uh, is able to reactivate it in Ascalon, that was uh, <laughs> that was pretty legit. I would love to see a video. That would be awesome. <laughs> Re oh, yeah. New Tomb, Tomb Guardian 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, pretty cool. It's like, well, since we're talking about bones, let me just take this into kind of an undead ghostly city and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, though, but oh, I have to say, the part at which he thinks that he killed the Norn guy, uh, Grulik, is that what the his name? Gullick. Oh, Gullick. Yeah. He thinks that he killed him. It felt so forced, like, in the way that he spoke. He's like, oh my god, I tried to kill the, 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 I tried to kill the ghost, but I killed the Norn, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not what I would say if I thought I just killed somebody. And, I would and be like, like, oh uh, no, like I killed no, him. He's, he's on a sword, and I was like, oh no, I didn't want to take out that tool yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, man. I thought they actually did kill him. They didn't show his body, but they basically described it as if he just wasn't there anymore. He was gone. Obliterated to pieces. Well, then, all... then he shows up later, bleeding like no one's business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty all awesome. Say, all they say is, like, oh, yeah, the bomb got thrown, and then, like, he goes flying. Yeah, it didn't actually occur to me that he had just been blasted really far away. So I thought totally. that was pretty well done. I thought he was actually well and truly gone. And there's the number of times they tried to kill somebody off, quote unquote, in this book, <laughs> and then they don't actually die. Is yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's interesting. I, I got one statement. Killeen is better better than Kate in every single way. Oh man, I love Killeen the Silvari. I don't know anything awesome. about Kate. You've read the second book already? Yeah. All right. I haven't I haven't seen Kate, but I don't know. It's gonna be hard to top Killeen because she's pretty awesome. She accidentally resurrects that <laughs> Riona's friend, and she's like, "Oh, oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> well, it's like, and then they're like, "She's like, should I put it back?" And they're like, "No, you already did it. Let's just keep going." <laughs> uh, let's see. Troa Black Frost. <laughs> I don't know what that. Troa Black Frost from the from the chat wants to know what he thinks. What we think the best fight was in the book. Um. That's a good question. I, I really liked the f the final fight between Riona and Dugal, uh, Dougal, mm -hmm. because of the way that he describes um, the the claw as like cutting her all the time. I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting because she didn't know how to use it, and I thought that was that was very interesting. And I thought maybe one of the tactics that he would do is just keep forcing her to cut herself uh, or something to that effect. But that was very interesting. God, I freaking love the fight with the Crystal Guardian. Oh yeah, that was amazing. I, yeah. I might have to say I agree with you there. Because there's so much specific, like this um, mechanical description stuff. Into how um, yeah. Colleen's necromantic um, spell is basically it's giving Gullic life stealing if we're using Guild Wars One mechanics. Yeah. yeah. And and with that, every time he attacks, it says his bones mended back together yeah. and <laughs> blood resurged into his body, and I'm just like. Why couldn't we see that in the original yeah. game? And as mm. much and as much as I liked the Asura and the Silvari, I have to say that Gullik the Norn is like the best guy ever. Because he's he's just like he's such whenever an idiot. first run into <laughs> he with him, an idiot. But, and he's like, "You kill my." It's like my name's Nigga Montoya. You kill my father. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more like you killed my cousin without singing about her glorious death. No, Prepare she died die. in your presence, and you did not honor her memory with a song. Prepare to die. <laughs> I love that. So, but well, then the best part is that he tells the story, and the guy's like, "Oh, we're friends now." It's yeah. Like, no, like they don't have any hatred. They just like to fight. It's the weirdest thing. And, yeah. and the great thing is, like, Colleen already knows who this guy is. It's like, oh yeah, that's go. Cool. Like, he's some Norn hero. Yeah, <laughs> he's my friend. <laughs> he's my friend. And I like. Um, when basically whenever they come up against some kind of bad guy and they're trying to be stealthy he's like okay guys see you later tell everybody how gloriously i died here we go they <laughs> 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 run jenkins them so many freaking times and then of course Killeen likes him so she goes back and fights with him and then <laughs> dugal's like but i like Killeen. dang it yeah. <laughs> oh man uh, I thought we were going to get some interspecies relationship going on in there, the way he kept talking about Killeen. 
Um, wow. That was very interesting. Um, and, uh, I like, though, that the Norn kind of grew over time once he realized what his being reckless had cost when Kaleem dies. Uh, I thought that was a really great job. Like, they didn't just keep him the same flat, funny, I'm the comic relief because I charge into battle. He then feels bad about it and sort of decides, maybe I shouldn't just do that all the time because it got somebody killed, you know? He cares. And her her grave supposedly is a landmark in Guild Wars 2, and we can go find it. Oh, that would be cool. That would be very cool. I'd feel sad. That was definitely a sad moment. I was waiting for them to, like, say, oh, she's not actually I mean, dead. She doesn't I, I, have to I, I mean, it was kind of obvious as they went into that fight. It's like, someone's got to die in this book. Yeah. It's yeah. the Silvari. I'm going to be mad. Yeah, yeah. But I think that was really important to show that Gullet can grow as a character. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, if he had died, it wouldn't have been nearly as moving a moment as if... You know, she dies, and he's basically the cause of it because they could have gotten away fine, except for him. Mm. So I, def- def- I definitely think Ember in this book got fleshed out a heck of a lot more than uh, Ritlock in the second. I like that we meet Ritlock in this br- in this book. I like Ritlock oh, yeah. only because his voice actor is that's phenomenal. Oh, yeah. that's the best name one. Ritlock you Brimstone, rank Tribune. Point. Steve you Bloom is have- amazing. About no adversary. It's like, oh, your faith is your weakness, humans. <laughs> Which actually awesome. goes back to the lore about how the char atheists now. Exactly, exactly. Oh. I, that didn't even occur to me until now. Wow, I like it. My favorite fight though is when they're in the uh, they're in the sewer system, <laughs> trying to lead up and hawk. Yeah, and then she and, calls um, up all the rats to eat everybody's face. Yeah, so like she just starts glowing oh. green. All the rats just come out of every nook and cranny. I was like, what the hell is she going to catch? She doesn't have any bodies to... Nope, she's got her, you know, rats. Tons of dead rats in the sewers. That's the great thing about <laughs> necromancers. You can never see what they're going to pull out of their sleeve. Yep, yep. They can do just about... Like, I think the way that they describe fighting in lore books is very different than the way you actually play the game. Yeah. Because when she summons... You know the minion after uh, Riona's friend dies. It's like, you know, that took a lot of time, a lot of energy, and now she's really focusing it. Whereas well, Guild Wars One, it's, it's definitely the way Matt Forbeck carried this out. He was looking just to describe things as he saw them. Like maybe mm-hmm. of he was given a few example spells from the game or whatnot, and he wrote them in. If you look at Book Two of who the hell. Book two, J. Robert King. You can literally tell when he stops writing about the book and starts writing about the game, the mechanics, and really like oh, yeah. meta games the book, and it gets annoying as hell. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it gets kind of weird. We'll have a we'll have a review of Edge of Destiny in the future after I get to chance to read it. But so, did you guys enjoy the first book or the second book better? Um, Different. Different. We were very. Yeah, I mean, the first... I, I'm looking forward to, to to hearing the story of Destiny's Edge, obviously. Um, and but I really did like all of the stories that were told within the story of the Ghosts of Ascalon, like Ember telling the st- her version of the fall of Ascalon City, and meanwhile, before that, you heard that Dougal's great. version. And I like how you you know there's not enough. Um, you know, histories in video games that really have the multi-sided history where one side says this happened and one side says that happened. And obviously that sort of reflects real history because the winners get to tell you what happened and they can twist the truth that makes them sound better yeah, for any yeah, content and purposes. Yeah, the first book definitely offers more of the history and then the second book offers more character development because those are the characters that we're going to be seeing throughout Go Wars 2. Now... The last thing I wanted to touch on before we, we wrap up the show here, um, did you guys buy really the, the ending the, where Riona <laughs> sort of just suddenly, aha, I was evil the whole time? Like, I, that rubbed me the wrong way. I, when they, I, I basically face palmed when I read that. I'm like, yeah. why? That's kind of what I did. Why? It kind of felt like, and now at the end, we need one final, you know, person to be a traitor. And that will make the ending suitably epic. Like, no, it didn't need to be suitably epic. I mean, 
I didn't buy her motivations. Like, she didn't strike me throughout the entire book. Her actions didn't strike me as someone who was, you know... I mean, she did obviously hate the char, but why the heck did she sign up to be part of the vigil if she didn't believe... I mean, she was she signed up willingly knowing that she was going to be working underneath Soul Keeper. Right? Soul Keeper oh, or Soul Stealer? What was the, the main char of the keep, vigil? Is Soul, Soul Keeper. Keeper. Mm -hmm. Soul Keeper. So well, wasn't it... It was either the, the vigil or prison, wasn't it? Because everyone else from her group, including Dougal, had abandoned her like in the night and she was stuck there and she was going to get in trouble. I don't remember, actually, now that you think it's, about it. Um, I'm at the end. I thought says... she went to prison, and then afterwards she, um, she went to the, join the vigil. She, she met up with the Flame Legion, and that's who she cut the deal with. I remember that part, yeah. She, she mm -hmm. cut the deal with the Flame Legion, basically trying to cause a civil war with the Char so that Ebonhawk could be, you know, regain Ascalon. It never sounded to me like that was as important to her and if it was, why the hell didn't she stay with the Ebon Vanguard? Maybe because she got kicked out? I don't know. Thinking about it, it could work, and it kind of does work, but when that happened, it felt forced and not really... It didn't flow from what I knew, I guess you could say. Well, just the whole thing about how, you know, Dougal and they're tied up, like, as slaves going through, and Ritlock sees them, and all of a sudden they get ambushed. So then she runs off to nowhere. If they had alluded to what was happening while she was running off it would have made sense but they just kind of spring it on you like oh she just talked to some guys and then I'm telling you now because I can yeah like, I, they, they they really hid I don't know I mean thinking about it they didn't hide her motivations completely I mean the whole part where she was up on the battlements before they left Ebon Hawk and she's having second mm -hmm. thoughts about this whole thing but when she was doing that, I didn't get the impression that she was having second thoughts because she wanted Ascalon to come back. You know, I, I don't know. Well, I knew she was... I could kind of tell that she really wasn't as interested in the treaty as was getting Ebon Hawk back to power and getting the char out of the siege. But she but, kind of... I mean, how can you argue with the, with the comment that clearly the dragons are the worst thing to happen right now? And if you crazy. now... Try to she fight a care. war to take... I guess she didn't care. Well, yeah. let me think about it. Krakatark already flew right next to Ebonhawk, so the dragons are gone. <laughs> so so as far as she can say, ah, who cares? Yeah, yeah. she yeah. don't care. She's like, uh, the very last remnant of Ascalonian civilization, Ebonhawk, is about to fall. This is my one chance to get it back. Yeah, I and guess. I'm, think and I'm thinking, alright, you're reaching for one little speck... And you're thinking you can retake all of Ascalon with that, and with that, you're going to use Ebon Hulk to repopulate Ascalon. Good luck with that. Yeah. So, That's let me ask hard. everybody here, and we'll ask everybody on the, um, on the main show next week, too, after the lore here. What race do you think you're going to play? So what's the race you're looking forward to playing the most? Uh, Malkior. <sighs> oh, crap. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And I was, oh. <laughs> We'll let you think. <laughs> okay. I, pretty, I think pretty much everyone knows that I'm going to play a char. Um, half of the reason is uh, I played Torin for six years. I just need this, this, this tail to swing in front of me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And just, I, they, are, they are designed great. They look great. They have a nice history I can relate. They are awesome. All right. They have horns. They have horns. You know they do have horns. You know Four horns, actually. Play, hmm? you, know, you know what profession you'll play? Guardian. A.K.A. Chardian. A Chardian? <laughs> That's awesome. You haven't heard of that first? No, I hadn't heard that, that yet. The, the first like real picture we had of a Guardian that confirmed it wasn't a human or anyone. It was a Char, and it became known as the Chardian. Ah. Yeah. So, in the book, we have sort of a silver mancer. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. We're <laughs> going to keep going with this. Markior, what do you think? What race are you going to be looking forward to playing the most? Oh, Jesus. I was trying to decide because I want to be in a, an annoying kind of snobbish, selfish Asura. <laughs> I want to dive into the new lore of the Silvari. But then I also want to help the human race of, like, rise back 
and with that, see the absolute glory that is Divinity's Reach. If anything allows oh, me to make Divinity's Reach looks so cool. Jeez, have you have you seen the video? The video is so oh, it's amazing. <laughs> it's huge. Oh okay. man, I, I've seen a like twenty. Maybe a forty minute something video. Someone spent their entire demo touring Divinity's Reach. Yeah, yeah, showing us the bar brawls and everything. That was like, cool. Like freaking a! Oh my god! And as Oberkid points out, you can jump everywhere. It's for that. <laughs> All right, Edwin, what's your favorite uh, the race you're looking forward to playing the most? Um, uh, lore wise, the Silvari, just because we know nothing about them. Um, but probably in Azura, mainly because I intend to level through World vs. World. Um, and barring, I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to do Hitbox. Like, I know Hitbox is going to be the same for every class, but unless in Azura has some massive aura around it to make it the same size as a Char or, as a, uh, char or an Orn, I'm probably going to play in Azura just so that you don't see me as quickly. But I would rather play a Silvari um, or Norn for the lore. So you'll cool. be like a thief or something? I'm probably going to play a ranger. Um, mm, cool. Because in World vs. World, they can just sit around stealth for weeks, just doing nothing. Yeah, just watching, scouting. I'll, I'll be the elementalist, like, blowing everyone up. So, I'm definitely going to make an elementalist first, and I'm definitely going to make a human elementalist first, because that's kind of just always what I wanted to do. Yes! But the Me one that I'm going to go stomping through Queensdale. Yeah, but what I am looking forward to playing the most is a Norn warrior, because I just want to be just like Golik. I just want to, I just want to troll people in World vs. World, and like if we're silently waiting for something, I just want to see like a whole team go by and just have like, let's go for glory. I wouldn't do that a whole lot, but I just want to be able to do that once. You're sitting in the thief's like group, uh, group stealth, and you just charge through it to like yeah. attack like 50 people in a zerg. I want to kill like four of them before I go down. Sing about me. Oh man, I just I just oh, love that concept. Oh, there was a named Bridger. <laughs> no, no, he was got himself that. in a rut. He went over his head, and now he is dead. He always was such a nut. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think that's a good time to end the show. You know, I have to say, I'm uh, I'm kind of impressed that the show only lasted an hour and a half. I'm glad we got through all the <laughs> interesting lore stuff that I wanted to touch on. Um, and we might go into more detail on, on some of the lore stuff, but hopefully now everybody listening has a concept of, uh, of what has happened in the world recently and how that affects everything going on. So, for everyone else there, I am Bridger, signing off for this night. Have a good one. See you next week, 8 o'clock on Sunday. Night. And by the way, huge shout out to uh, whoever it was, Vanha. For the donation he left us this week, you can you can donate if you want to. Uh, check out uh, if you if you if you enjoyed the show that you just heard. If you think it's worth a dollar, send us a dollar. www.talesofteria.com is how you can find it on the left hand side donation button. See you later.